Hello everyone, good afternoon from Singapore. My name is Clemens Che and welcome to the 11th installment of our Bridging the Gulf Public Education series. So far, we have done 10 episodes, including country-specific episodes on each Gulf state. We've done, all, we've done episodes on broader themes such as energy, domestic politics, and also geopolitics. We've also done cultural segments like falconry and uh, ancient cities such as Nizwa in, in Oman. So today, I am very pleased to announce that we are having a webinar on politics and sport in the Gulf. And our guest speaker for today is none other than Professor Simon Chadwick. I will shortly introduce his profile, but I'd like to say that this comes with the buzz surrounding the Saudi takeover of Newcastle United FC. And of course, uh, Simon and I, we have done a taster on, on addressing a few issues uh, in this takeover notably the recent uh, investment by Sabic, which is Saudi Arabia's chemical manufacturing company in Tees Valley in the northeast of, of England. So I think Simon will be talking more about this later on, and I'm sure everyone has uh, a lot of burning questions uh, after his presentation. And, you know, more recently, and of course, Simon has tweeted about this, there are questions over a possible acquisition of a stake in Spartak Moscow Football Club by City Football Group. And this coincides with a visit by Khaldun Al Mubarak, uh, prospective, his prospective visit to Moscow, Al Mubarak being the boss of Mubadala, Abu Dhabi's financial arm. And Abu Dhabi also recently bought a 2.6% 2, 2 stake in Russia's EN Plus Group and also announced plans to transfer Etihad Airways uh, Russian operations to the new Alexander Pushkin Airport. So these can be these developments can be sort of a coincidence, which I'm sure our speaker today will, will develop shortly. And uh, let me now introduce the profile and bio of our speaker, Professor Simon Chadwick, who is the Global Professor of Eurasian Sport at EM Lyon Business School in Paris. He also directs the school's Center for the Eurasian Sport Industry, CSI, based in Shanghai. He previously founded and directed the University of London's Birkbeck Sports Business Center and Coventry University Center for the International Business of Sport. He has worked at a number of uh, prestigious business schools and also held various positions across Asia and has direct experience of working in the Middle East. His research, writing, consultancy, and teaching focuses on, as he told me before, number one, uh, the business of sport, and number two, the geopolitical economy of sport. So, before I hand it over to Simon, I'd like to lay down a few house rules. Of course, I'm sure that you have many questions that will be addressed to Simon uh, later on after his presentation. So this, if you'd like to put forward a question, please use the Zoom chat and send it across to MEI events. And this will be redirected so that we can order the questions uh, according to the timing of their submission. Okay, without further ado, Further ado, let me hand it over to Professor Simon Chadwick. Over to you, Simon. Hi, Clemens. Can you can you hear me? Okay. Okay, perfect. So you've stolen all my best lines, Clemens. All my be the latest inserts into my presentation. Now I, I'll, I'll finish now. I'll just say end now. And and Clemens has uh, has said everything that I was going to say. But uh, thank you, Clemens, really for uh, your introduction. And, and thank you for inviting me and to uh, your your Middle East Institute as well. And for everybody who uh, who is here. Um, thank you. Uh, what I'm going to try and do is to keep it short and sharp, which for me is very, very difficult. For those of you who know me, uh, it's very, very difficult, but I'm gonna try uh, at least. Um, it's really uh, it's really good to, to, to see that there are some people, not just from East Asia here, uh, there seem to be one or two people from the Middle East and, and one or two people also from Europe. And I know for people in Europe, it's especially difficult because it's, uh, it's still relatively early in the morning. So for everybody who's here, um, thank you. Let me uh, bring up my slides, if I may. Uh, and hopefully, Clements, you can see that OK? Perfect. Thank you. Just to, to make a comment on the title. And, and I think this is really important because over the last 18 months in particular with, with the Newcastle United 
uh, takeover or the, the rather protracted Newcastle United takeover by Saudi Arabia's public investment fund, there's been this popular conception and also this popular use, use of a phrase, sport washing. And I'm not going to discount sport washing from today's conversation because I think it is a, it is a term that demands closer scrutiny. Uh, it's a term that may be worth applying in some circumstances, but I don't think it's a term for me uh, that needs to be used today for two reasons. Firstly, because I think there's an awful lot going on in the Gulf region around the around investment in sport. And, and so for those people in the West who are labeling this as sport washing, I think it's it's a very simplistic uh, and a very reductionist application of a, of a term. Um, I think the second reason that I'm not going to talk about sport washing today is because if we want to, to lay this term at the door of any country, uh, then we have to start by laying it at the door of Great Britain. Because if you look back to colonial times, my view is, is that, that Britain was, it was the original sport washer. It used sport as a means of, of distracting people's attention away from other things. So I just wanted to, to set that to one side. So sport washing, I've mentioned it, but I'm not going to dwell on it, although it is a, an, an important term that demands scrutiny. The second thing that I want to pick up on is, is this use of the, the phrase soft power. And, and um, it's really important to, to emphasize that I think there is an element of, of soft power in, in what is happening. But again, there is so much more. And, and so we'll let that title hang just there in front of us. And, and you can take it and think about it or reject it. Or you know, it's, it's just an entry point to, to talking about other things. Now, I think the other thing to say about me, and, and, and Clemens has always already provided the introduction, is, is that I'm not a political scientist. I'm not an international relations expert. Um, I'm not somebody with a long track record of, of writing about soft power. What I am is a business school academic. And I started my life teaching, well, I started my life teaching kind of business and economics. And then I drifted into much more about around, about around marketing. And then I got into um, applying business economics marketing in a, in, a, in, a, in a sport context. And I did that, number one, because I'm a sport fan. Um, but I think secondly, I did it because around the time when I, I began to research and write about um, business and sport, the Premier League was relatively new. In fact, it was three years old. The first time I wrote something about, about sport from a business perspective, it was three years old. But as time has gone on, and especially over the last 10 years, one of the things that I, I'd started to observe is, is the world seems to be a little different now to how it used to be. So, for instance, I, 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 I observed this um, state-owned airline Emirates Airlines, which at the time, going back to 2006, 2007, when it first signed a deal with, with Arsenal, I, I thought, this is a little different to McDonald's, another sponsor, or to Coca-Cola, another sponsor. You know, it's an airline, it's state-owned. It's this, this country, Dubai, which at the moment seems to consist of cranes uh, and very little else. And so... From that moment onwards, and, and certainly over the last 10 years, as I've said, I, I've started to shift my view of the world and to think about business and marketing and economics, uh, sponsorship. My doctoral study, my thesis was on sports sponsorship and to view it through the lens much more of, of what's happening, not just in the Gulf region, but I think across, across Asia more generally. And clearly, if we're thinking about you know, Emirates sponsorship of Arsenal or Real Madrid or um, AC Milan or Hamburg or you know, whoever else. What you have there is this link, this connection between Europe and Asia. And so this really forms the main part of, of my work today. Um, in terms of. Uh, sorry, give me a second. Well, whilst I figure out how to do this, there we are. OK, so. For those of you who, who do want to know more about what I 
talk about and what I write about and what I research about, by all means, take a look at my Twitter timeline. If you've got questions after today's uh, um, webinar, you can, you can email me. For those of you in East Asia who are using, for example, WeChat, uh, you're uh, you're welcome to, uh, to to scan my WeChat QR code and, and send me messages through that route. Otherwise, in terms of some of the recent things that I've done, just so you know, and, and this is blatant marketing, the, the one on the left is blatant marketing, uh, a book coming out soon. It's not specifically about the Qatar World Cup, but it's certainly inspired by and informed by the Qatar World Cup. Um, the book on the right uh, it's been out for a couple of years now, but I contributed a chapter to the business of sport in the GCC, which uh, you may find it helpful to, to take a look at. And the book in the middle is coming out soon. Uh, and I write about in this book about um, football fans from a commercial perspective in the GCC region as well. Can I just say at this point, if you find me looking down to, to kind of like this, it's because I've got my other laptop here. So I know which slides are coming next. So I don't get confused. So if it looks as though I'm kind of drifting off or falling asleep, I'm not really. I'm, I'm just looking at this other, uh, this other laptop. Now, if I was to use just one image of an entity, if we call it, can call it an entity, I don't know whether I would call it an organization a state vehicle, um, a business, a football club. I don't know what I would call it at this point. But for the purposes of introduction, if I was to think about an entity that really embodies what interests me, it is this picture here. And, and, and in some ways, this is kind of old world meets new world. And the old world is Manchester City. Uh, for, for those of you who know your football, Manchester City is uh, an English professional football club established in the late 19th century on the east side of Manchester. You know, real kind of solid working class product of the Industrial Revolution. Um, east Manchester is a little different to that nowadays, but even so, you know, it, Manchester City in many ways embodies what, what, what football certainly modern football, contemporary football came from. But then at the same time, what you have there is Abu Dhabi and not just Abu Dhabi and its ownership of Manchester City, but Abu Dhabi and, and the state-owned airline Etihad. Clements has already made a reference to, uh, to Etihad this morning. We know that, that the, the stadium in Manchester that, that City plays in is now the Etihad Stadium. There are a whole bunch of other things that we could say about this intersection of the two, like, for example, the way in which Etihad and Manchester City together have served as a means through which to influence local political decisions. So in Manchester right now, there is a massive building boom with um, premium residential accommodation being built. And that is essentially a partnership between Abu Dhabi and, uh, and um, Manchester City Council enabled by the ownership of Manchester City. So if you want a summary of everything that, that really interests me, this photograph is it. Now I could stop at that point, but I suspect that you want more than just one photograph. So I suppose I'd better continue. Um, and I suppose the next point on, on the, 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 the journey of today's presentation, and, and Clements has already alluded to this, is as I was as I was sitting comfortably yesterday and thinking about uh, my presentation and thinking, yeah, I've I've done it. I'm ready. You know, tomorrow I can get up out of bed and I can come online and and everything is going to be fine. And then, as you can see there, four fifty six or five to five in the the afternoon yesterday, I I suddenly became aware of this report um, from the Russian media that that City Football Group, the owners of Manchester City are uh, contemplating acquiring a 20% stake in Spartak Moscow. Now, it's really interesting. I, you know, I, 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 I've been thinking, I think on an ongoing basis about City Football Group, not because I'm a fan of Manchester City, but because I'm interested in City Football Group. And I had anticipated that we might see, for example, a franchise in Africa. And so I was really surprised to, 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 to receive this news that uh, they may be acquiring a stake in Spartak Moscow. I'm not going to say anything more about it at this point, other than I created a thread, and Clemens has, has clearly read that thread, 
and and when you begin to to kind of scroll through the thread you'll see that that you know, there are there are several reasons why um Mubadala, the sovereign wealth fund of abu dhabi, abu dhabi uh yc football group um why the united arab, arab emirates may be forging this this uh relationship with with russia and and with the government in moscow and I guess at this point, before I start the, the kind of substance, the real substance of my presentation, what I would invite you all to do is to, 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 to kind of keep in mind that football is an enabler. It's amazing. I, I, when, I, when I meet people and, and I say, well, I, I write about football, that's it immediately. Nothing else matters. You know, it's, it's let's talk about favorite team. Let's talk about favorite game. Let's talk about favorite player. And so I think in terms of enabling business relationships, in terms of engaging in diplomacy, in terms of sealing business deals, football has an incredible power that arguably no other form of human, human activity has. And so for those of you who worry, who, who worry or wonder about that, you know, what you might think is a tenuous relationship between Premier League football, for example, and gas exploration in the Arctic, you know, there, it's not a tenuous link. I think football is the means to an end. And that's an important detail. Football is the means to an end. It's not an end in itself. Ask a lot of Newcastle United fans and they think Saudi Arabia is investing because Newcastle United is a fantastic team and you know, the Premier League is the greatest league in the world and they're going to win the Champions League. It's not. Saudi Arabia's public investment fund is invested in Newcastle United as a means to an end, not an end in itself. So already in the first 10 minutes or so, I've, I've covered a lot of ground. Um, but what I want to try and do is, is, is to glue that all together. And one of the things that I've been trying to do over the last 10 years in understanding this is to glue this all together. So give me just a second because my other computer has just gone to sleep. Okay, so the way in which I glue this all together is by thinking in terms of the geopolitical economy of sport. And what I'm going to do today is to advocate this view. I'm hoping that a published paper on this will come very early next, uh, next year, next calendar year. Because for me, what I think we're seeing is, is a very different kind of sport. You know, 19th century was very much dominated by Europe. I've talked about the Industrial Revolution, working class industrial areas in, in, in places like Manchester. The 20th century for me was very much the US century in sport. And if we think about sponsorships and naming rights and TV deals. That was very much a product of US influence of, on sport in the 20th century. But I think we're entering the, almost like a third age of sport now, which I would call the geopolitical economy of sport, whereby the role of Asia is prominent and not just the Gulf, but also East Asia. You know, I include, include Singapore in that, but Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, crucially, Importantly, China, Japan too. But I think it, what's important as well is, is, is that clearly if we're thinking about, if we are thinking about Qatar or Saudi Arabia or Abu Dhabi, you know, we're seeing state, state influence, sovereign wealth fund investment, uh, connections to state-owned airlines. If we think about Paris Saint-Germain and Qatar, You've got Accor Hotels as the main shirt sponsor in which the Qatar Investment Authority has a significant shareholding. For those of you who can think about that PSG shirt on the tail at the back, you have Uredu, which is the state-owned telecoms provider. You'll see QMB, Qatar National Bank, state-owned bank. You'll know that PSG also has a, um, a, a relationship with the Qatar Tourism Council as well. And so... There's considerable state involvement. So essentially what we have here is a very different kind of influence on global sport. And it's this notion, hopefully, of ge the geopolitical economy of sport that really captures this. So let me just say um, 
say something about what the characteristics of the geopolitical economy of sport might be. And then what I will do is to apply that in the context of uh, a Gulf nation. The pictures at the side on the right are not, not accidental. They're absolutely not accidental. There is a reason why they're there. And, and in this particular case, McLaren F1 team, you know, for those of you who know anything about uh, about Formula One, you know, McLaren F1 team was established by an Australian racing driver, Bruce McLaren, I think back in the 1960s. The heyday of the McLaren F1 team was kind of 1970s into the 1980s. The team that then had a massive resurgence. Lewis Hamilton became world champion when he was uh, um, uh, driving for McLaren for the first time. Now McLaren is owned, uh, majority owned by um, Mumtalakat, the Bahrain Sovereign Wealth Fund. But what we've seen over the last 12 months is that the Saudi Arabian Public Investment Fund has also taken a shareholding in McLaren as well. So essentially, this is a team based in Britain, uh, largely populated by British engineers with a history that originates in Australia. Um, but it is owned out of nowadays, out of the Gulf. And so again, Eurasian, and, and again, you know, in thinking in terms of the geopolitical economy, the team is significant. So what I'm going to contend today is, is that essentially sport today is an outcome of geography. And, and if you begin to, to think about the GCC nations and their geographic positions, and I, I'll clarify what I mean by this in, in just a moment, um, sport is an outcome of geography. Sport is an instrument, a political instrument. And when we're talking about political instrumentation, uh, we can then begin to discuss uh, soft power. And if we think about you know, Qatar 2022, or we think about, for that matter, um, Beijing staging of, of the 2008 Olympic Games and the 2022 Winter Olympic Games, you know, we can see this. If we think about Japan and, and the original intention of the Japanese government when it bid to host the uh, uh, the 2020 Olympic Games, there was a, a soft power and a political dimension to this. But I think there's also an economic dimension too. Um, as part of Vision 2030 in Saudi Arabia, in, in United Arab Emirates, in, in Bahrain, uh, sport plays an important part in, in, in the vision of these countries for their economic development. Um, and if I could give you a further illustration of, of sport as a source of economic activity, South Korea is a great example. So South Korea has an e-sport strategy. Uh, and, and what South, South Korea as a country is trying to do is, is to become the world's leading nation in terms of not just playing esports, but develop, developing hardware, developing software, becoming a center for event hosting, um, you know, creating tech startups around um, around the esport industry. So again, that gives a flavor of the economic activity and advantage. But I think the, the, the two other features that I mentioned there is, I think sport is a means of deploying and acquiring resources. The example that I would give here is, is China's policy of stadium diplomacy in, in Africa. So essentially the Chinese government for the last 15 years has, has gifted very often stadiums to African nations as a, as a, as a, a means through which to, uh, to secure access to natural resources. So I think sport is a way of deploying and acquiring resources, and it's also a basis for securing strategic and competitive advantage. And that very much goes hand in hand with this notion of deploying and acquiring resources. And I think this, for me, this is really, uh, really interesting because every time I think about sport, and I think about sport a lot, you know, you, probably you know, on average, about 30 seconds of, of every minute of every day, I'm thinking about sport and, and what it all means. And, and nowadays, when I think about sport, I very often trace it, its origins, its current origins back to gas, to oil. Uh, to precious metals, to minerals, to exploration for, for new sources of, of natural resources. Um, and, and for those of you who are sat there thinking, what on earth are you talking about, Simon? Are you mad? You know, it's, a, it's a game. You, you kick a ball. Uh, but I go back to the earlier point that I made. 11 people playing against another 11 people kicking a ball 
is not just about sport. It's, it's, it's about something much more significant than that. Certainly today, and if you know the famous phrase of, of Liverpool manager Bill Shankly, he said, you know, it's, it's, it's even more important than, than, than life and death. You know, I think we are definitely in, in, in this territory right now. So let me let me distill this all down. So, you know, sport is about more than kicking. Uh, football is about more than kicking a ball. I think it's about geopolitical economy. I've told you what my what my view of geopolitical economy is. For me, geopolitical economy glues everything together. It brings everything together. In my mind, it gives me a, a much better sense and focus for for, for what's happening in in football right now. So let me illustrate it all using an example, the example of Qatar. And I am then going to kind of draw to a close, but I will briefly make a comment on Newcastle United and Saudi Arabia because I feel as though I have to, because I know Clemens is, a, is a, an honorary Geordie. And if you don't know what a Geordie is, Google it. But Clemens is now an honorary Geordie. So I, I have to talk a little bit about Newcastle United. So what I always find it find interesting about Qatar, and I, and I use Qatar very often as a as a as part of my teaching, and I always say to students, find Qatar on a map for me. And and most students can't, so even now they don't know where Qatar is. But what I do is I I get them to bring up a map of Qatar, and 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 we then talk about you know what do you see, you know what what do you see in in there. And you know, inevitably, we talk about Saudi Arabia to the to the west, Iran to the east, to the north. Uh, you have Iraq, and, and a little further uh, to the north again, you have Turkey. Um, strategically, Qatar occupies a very interesting position. Uh, it's relatively vulnerable in strategic terms. It nevertheless has considerable asset nat nat or natural resource wealth. We know there are some um, issues that the, the country faces. So for example, it shares a land border with Saudi Arabia. And, and if we look back across or the history of, of, of the peninsula, you know, clearly there are very strong connections between Qatar and Saudi Arabia. We know that, Sa that Qatar always also shares access to one of the world's largest underwater natural gas fields. Uh, the inconvenient truth for, 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 for many nations is uh, Qatar shares that, that gas field with Iran. Um, so whilst Qatar is quite vulnerable, it also puts Qatar in a very interesting position because it has leverage over countries like Iran that, that certainly the United States and Saudi Arabia don't necessarily have. Now, I'm drifting into, in, into politics and international relations and diplomacy. I'm a business school guy who writes about sport. But crucially, and if I could just highlight an example for you, um, three years ago, Qatar signed a deal with the Iranian Football Association to use Kish Island as a training base ahead of the 2022 World Cup. So, you know, you, you, you might think, well, football and the World Cup, you know, in terms of the relationship between Qatar and Iran, and, and you set that in a much broader geopolitical context, and there are a whole stream of issues come out of that. But I think the fact that we could see, I don't know, Brazil, or we could see you know, England or Japan or another nation using Iran's Kish Island as a training base and then flying in every, for every game to Doha to, to, to take part in next year's World Cup. Whether this happens remains a moot point, but I think it does raise some very, very interesting issues. And again, it, it reinforces the point that football sits right at the very heart of a much broader geopolitical economy. And so again, you know, we, we do need to talk about the geopolitical economy of sport. So what do we know about, uh, about Qatar? Well, we, we, what do we know about the geography of Qatar? Well, we, we, we know something already about its position. Uh, we also know something about its natural resource endowment. And so in terms of the physical geography of, of, of Qatar, we can begin to understand how it is that they might spend 200 million euros on, on Neymar. 
it's interesting. I speak to, 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 to some fairly senior people in football on a regular basis. And, and somebody said to me at the time of the signing of Neymar, we just can't compete with this. We, we, we just can't do that because we're not owned by a, a gas and oil rich state. You know, we're, we're owned by a, an entrepreneur and there's no way an entrepreneur from the West is going to spend 200 million euros on, on, on Neymar. So immediately we, begin, we can begin to see the connections between you know, natural resource endowments and, and even the signing of players. But we also know that there's something about the human geography of, of, of Qatar. Um, if we take, for example, the population composition, so approximately 3 million people in Qatar, 10% of whom are Qataris, 90% of the population, they're, they're expatriates, they're immigrants, um, obviously coming from the MENA region, uh, many of them from, from Morocco, from Algeria, from Lebanon, from Syria and, and elsewhere, um, from Europe, but also considerable numbers of Filipino uh, service workers. Uh, you also have you know, people coming from, from India to, to work in, um, in various different uh, um, jobs. So there's an issue of social cohesion in, in Qatar, uh, certainly in terms of a coherent national identity. And so sport is, is widely acknowledged as being a means through which to, to establish much stronger social cohesion, to build a coherent national identity. And for those of you who may have been to a, a sporting event um, in in not just in Qatar, but in somewhere like you know, Abu Dhabi or Dubai, you will know that you know, when we're watching the World Handball Final, and I was at the World Handball Final in 2015 between Qatar and, and France, and, and we ceased to be a disparate community of individuals in Qatar. We, we all became Qatari for that day. You know, we were all cheering on Qatar, and, and so you know, we were a coherent group of people. And so the social purpose if you like, that, that sport serves, certainly in human geographic terms, is significant. But of course, there's also a political dimension to all of this. Um, Qatar is a rentier state, uh, no taxation without democracy, or so should I say, no democracy without taxation. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with the terminology uh, and, and, and what the ramifications of, of a rentier state is, essentially rentier state, resource rich, um, no democracy without taxation, uh, ex external investment overseas. Um, I'll leave, I'll leave the, the, the rest of the detail um, for, for people to, to pursue. But essentially what, what countries like Qatar and Saudi Arabia and others have to do is to, to pursue um, rent generation, if we want to call it simplistically revenue generation from overseas investments. We also know that certainly in, in Qatar, the 2030 vision, the national development plan is underpinned by a commitment to uh, sport. And that goes hand in hand with, for instance, human capital development, which is a key pillar of, of Qatar's national development strategy. And it, it addresses, as we've already said, issues like social cohesion, but it also addresses issues such as sedentary lifestyle. So one of the things that we know, not just about Qatar, but also about Saudi Arabia and, and, and some of the other GCC nations, it is very high rates of teenage diabetes. And it's not just teenagers. We, we see really some very concerning gender figures for participation and, and, and active lifestyles. And so I think Governments in the region see sport as a means through which for, for, uh, to promote um, uh, more physical activity, greater physical, physical activity. Uh, some of you will know that there are only six countries in the world that have a national sports day when basically the country shuts down and everybody plays sport. Um, Qatar is one of those countries. It has a national sports day, 18th of February, I think it is every year. But we also know that sport serves a role politically in terms of nation building, nation branding. And if, if we go back to the map of Qatar, what it looks like, it's, it's, it's history. It was a British protectorate until 1971. The, develop, the more recent development of its oil and gas industry, the development of, of Doha in particular, but 
obviously more generally nas national infrastructure. So there are issues around nation building, nation branding. We've talked about soft power, uh, diplomacy, international relations too. And the, and the purpose that its investments serve in terms of, you know, for instance, staging of the, the, the World Cup, um, the ownership of Paris Saint-Germain, the recent uh, successful bid to um, stage a Formula One Grand Prix all serve a purpose in terms of uh, the political agenda that exists within Qatar. And then there's the economics. And, and, and obviously this is, this is my, my own personal industrial heartland. It's, it's what I know and, and what I understand most. Um, sport provides a basis for economic, just, uh, e economic div diversification. We see this already with, with Qatar and some of the examples we've, we've mentioned so far. But I think it's also important to, to, to highlight, for example, the Aspatar Sport Injury Clinic. So for those of you who know the Aspire Zone in, in Doha, the Aspatar Sport Injury Clinic is, is Qatar's attempt to position itself as one of the world's leading sport medicine hubs. You've also got the, 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 the Doha Sport Tech Industrial Cluster. Uh, what, what the Qatari government is trying to do is to um, promote new business startups in the field of uh, sport tech development. And this really addresses the third point there that, you, that, that I make about, you know, there are real concerns as, as I'm sure some of you will know about big state in the GCC about the, the inefficient approach to business that that big state intervention uh, leads to and some of the issues around bureaucracy. So, you know, this notion of tech startups and, and about being lean and entrepreneurial and fast moving and dynamic, there is something about not, not just about economic diversification, but also about changing the culture of business, business enterprise and, and, and the development of, of, of startups. It's not just Qatar. You know, we, we, we're seeing this now in Saudi Arabia. You see it in Israel too. If, if for those of you who are, are familiar with the Israel Startup Nation Cycling Team, you know this is uh, this is uh, uh, sponsored by an initiative in Israel to to, to pursue um, the same kind of uh, um, strategy. And I think the other thing too, we've we've already alluded to uh, some of the infrastructural developments in in. Um, in, in, in Qatar and, and in Doha specifically, uh, you will, many of you will now know Qatar has a motorway network. It also has a metro network. That metro network very conveniently can, connects all of the World Cup stadiums. Obviously, the, the marketing cell, the big play is, hey, you're going to be able to watch three games in a day. Just jump on the metro and you'll be able to do this. But I think crucially, it, again, it goes back to the earlier point is if you want a metro network, just build a metro network. You know, why not just do that? What sport does and what football does in particular is, is, it, is it focuses minds and it provides the impetus to enabling infrastructural development in a way that um, very often other industrial sectors don't. So what Qatar now has is it has a metro network that will exist long, long after the World Cup has gone. But clearly the, the World Cup has played a very important role in, an, in enabling that infrastructural development to take place. So you have the geography, you have the politics, you have the economics, you have this geopolitical economy of sport. That's the glue that I've used and, and I'm going to continue using to bring all of this together. And so this leads us very nicely and conveniently um, to just a brief comment on Newcastle United. I see you know, very similar play by Saudi Arabia, the public investment fund. Uh, we hear stories that, that um, the public investment fund may also be interested in acquiring Italy's Inter Milan. You know, this is very resonant of uh, um, what's happened at City Football Group. We, we also hear stories that Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabian funding, perhaps from the Public Investment Fund, is behind FIFA's calls for, a, 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 or Gianni Infantino's calls for a biennial um, World Cup. Uh, so you know, I think it's safe to assume that we, we will see 
more high profile football matches and in fact sporting events taking place more generally in in Saudi Arabia what Saudi Arabia what does a public investment fund specifically see in in Newcastle United I'm, I'm going to mention two things um I could spend the whole day talking about this and I, but I know we can't um you know, keep in mind that that uh, Nasser Al Khalifi Khalifi the uh the um who runs the Qatar Sports Investments uh, and is also par- president of Paris Saint-Germain. He now is the head of the European Clubs Association. Uh, you also have Abu, D- Abu Dhabi that through Manchester City and the City Football Group has 10 franchises across the world, possibly an 11th if Spartak Moscow uh, um, is acquired. The, these two countries now have considerable influence on world football through their ownership of football clubs. Uh, Saudi Arabia didn't have that. By owning, Man- by owning Newcastle United, immediately, you know, public investment fund, uh, they're going to be able to attend Premier League meetings. They're going to be able to influence uh, um decisions that are made by the Premier League. The Premier League and the English Football Association together are members of UEFA. So now Saudi Arabia is sitting at European football's top table. It can begin for, begin to influence decisions. But I think the second thing that I would mention is, is, is that Newcastle United is a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. So for instance, uh, Saudi Arabia is in the process of creating a new national airline. My view would be, uh, ultimately, the, that, that airline will become Newcastle United shirt sponsor. Uh, the Premier League is broadcast live in 204 territories around the world. Saudi Arabia has paid $300 million, pounds, 300 million pounds for, uh, for Newcastle United. 300 million pounds for a global advertising platform for your new national airline is good value for money as far as I'm concerned. But I think the interesting thing too is Newcastle United, northeast of England, the northeast of England is very rapidly positioning itself as the wind power capital of Britain. Uh, This very much plays to Saudi Arabia's agenda and the public investment fund's agenda about developing new sustainable sources of energy, reducing dependence upon uh, carbon fuel revenues, and so on and so forth. So although there might be very, might be lots of Newcastle United fans out there in the world who are saying, you know, it's all about the football, it's all about Kylian Mbappe signing for, for United, it's not. For Saudi Arabia, it is about football, but it's about a number of other things as well. So to conclude, well, I think I've talked for quite long enough. Uh, My conclusion is there is a lot happening. It's not just about sport washing and soft power. It is about the geopolitical economy of football. It is about this combination of geography, politics, and economics. Will it continue? Yes, it will. Uh, Will the Gulf nations, the GCC nations become more powerful, more influential? Yes, they will. Uh, will they acquire more football clubs? I think so. Um, and there, there are going to be multiple reasons for this. And as I mentioned at the start, if the 19th century belonged to Europe and football and the 20th century was influenced very much by the United States, then this 20th century, sorry, 21st century, you know, the big decisions, not just in football, but I think sport more generally, are going to be driven by Doha, by Riyadh, by Beijing, uh, by Singapore, by Manila. Keeping in mind that Manila, Manila is the home of the Asian Football Confederation. You know, these cities, these countries and their geographic, economic, political interests will be important. So thank you for listening. And I'm going to stop stop screen sharing. Um, and hand back to, to Clements and say to people who are here, thank you for, for being here today. Thank you, Simon. And thank you for connecting the dots because uh, that's important because we, we are, what we often see in the media is, is that, you know, especially for the fans, you know, this is like a major development, but 
they don't really see the broader picture. So thank you for connecting the dots. And I'd like to invite our audience to put forward their questions now. I'm sure you have uh, many burning ones. So please put them in the Zoom chat to MEI events. We will then uh, forward it to me. So I want to go back a bit as, as you know, exercise my privilege as moderator and go back a bit to, to the Newcastle uh, episode. And in fact, it was a saga that it was, it was stalled for a while before, before it was pushed through. I'd like to ask Simon, you know, you know what, what was the Johnson government thinking you know, in supporting this deal? That's number one. And uh, number two, what, what really is the potential of Newcastle as a city, as a, as a county, and we know that it has a coal mining and railway history, but what else is in there for, for the PIF, for the Public Investment Fund to develop? That's actually a great, great question, Clements, and also a really interesting one because stories of, of, uh, stories of PIF interest in acquiring a, a Premier League football club um, really go back to kind of 2017, 2018. And at that time, there were several reports that, that PIF wanted to buy Manchester United. Um, and, and I think in an ideal world, PIF would really have bought Manchester United. Um, but there were really, uh, I, I guess there was one fundamental point is, is the Glazer family didn't want to sell. But then the, the price that was being quoted by the Glazers to PIF was, was in the order of about £3 billion, which is obviously 10 times um, what, is, what essentially uh, Newcastle United uh, uh, sold for. So it was, we've, we've always known that I think Saudi Arabia, maybe there was an element of a vanity purchase, maybe there was a, 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 an element of, you know, um, isomorphism or mim mimicry in the sense that uh, because Qatar had bought Paris Saint-Germain, Abu Dhabi had bought Manchester City, Saudi Arabia also wanted to buy a club but wanted to buy the, the best club. But the stories uh, dissipated. And, and as I say, I think that was because of the reluctance of the Glazer family to sell. And then during 2019, stories then began to circulate about Newcastle United, and then the stories came back again in 2020. Now, my, my view of all of this is, is that the role of the intermediaries, and those intermediaries are still involved in the claim in Newcastle United now, is, is they were essentially trying to pitch a deal to various investors, and they struck lucky with Saudi Arabia. And so I, my, my view is that the Saudi Arabians strategically didn't, didn't intend to buy Newcastle United, but because they were pitched a speculative deal, that was the basis upon which the whole Newcastle United affair started. And, and, I, and I think going back to 2018, 2019, there was no Johnson government at that time. It was a Theresa May government and Theresa May was was having to deal with with the Brexit negotiations. She wasn't a football fan. I don't think she was actively touting the Middle East or, or the Gulf region at that particular point in time. But what we saw really was the convergence of, you know, the speculative pitch, Saudi Arabia and PIF, you know, being open to a, an acquisition, Brexit happening, the Johnson government getting elected the ramifications of his election. And, and I think you know, the, the, plat the platform upon which Johnson was, was elected was um, seeing Brexit through, and that had consequences in terms of the economic impact and, and the political relationships of, of the country. But at the same time, Johnson, uh, Johnson came to power on the back of what was known in Britain as the Red Wall Vote. And, and, and the Red Wall vote is, is historically hardcore left-wing Labour Party supporting constituencies, former industrial, mining, shipbuilding areas. And Johnson promised them the world. You know, they, they, there's this levelling up agenda. We're going to make you wealthy again. The, the rich South, you're going to be put, put back on a parity with them. So Johnson needs to make good on his promises to, to these people. And, and Newcastle 
is prime red wall voting territory. So this all conveniently came together. And I think June last year, the British government began to realize that there was a win-win-win situation here. So you know, Saudi Arabia gets its club. The existing owner of Newcastle United can sell the club. The speculative pictures of the, of the deal, they get their part. But the Johnson government also gets its part in all of this as well. So in other words, Saudi Arabian inward investment into not just the Premier League, but the Northeast, that plays to the Red Wall voting agenda. Um, it also enables the relationship with Saudi Arabia. And as we know, the Johnson government is now actively touting inward investment from Saudi Arabia. And, and that's not just you know, in terms of the arms industry. As you mentioned, right at the very top of the, the, the webinar, um, Clemens, we've since seen investment into, into the chemicals industry uh, from Saudi Arabia in, in, in the northeast, close to Newcastle, in this red wall voting area. We are hearing stories about Saudi Arabian investment into the Northeast England wind power industry. So again, again this plays to um, the point that I made about football is a means to an end. It's an enabler. It, 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 it allows things to happen. Uh, and, and so what I think we're, we're seeing is, is, is that that Newcastle United sale and, and the acquisition by PIF you know, notwithstanding all of the the, the media coverage and, and, and the hype. And, and I think it, in, in terms of, not just in terms of financial figures and business symbolically, it represents something significant in terms of the relationship between Britain and Saudi Arabia. Thanks, Simon. I think the, the questions are flowing in, so we'll try to cover as many as possible. Uh, I'm sure our members of our audience are putting on their thinking caps right now. So, so the next question comes from my colleague, Alessandro Adrino. His question is, what happens when a sovereign wealth fund investment in a football club or any other high-level sports team become an embarrassment? As an example, Gaddafi's LIA SWF invested in the Italian soccer club, Ju Juventus, and when the European Union sanctions on Libya's SWF, Sovereign Wealth Fund, and its subsidiaries hit. It was not a minor problem for Juventus and a source of embarrassment for Italy. And, and I think this goes back to your sports washing, and this also applies to the, the critics that have been talking about this is a way of uh, attempting to mislead and, and distract. But what's your take on, on, on this? That's a, again, that's a really interesting question. And, and thanks, thanks for, for asking it. Um, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Abu Dhabi, as the three most obvious examples, they're not Libya. You know, they're, they're not Gaddafi era, era Libya. I think what's really interesting is, is, is that these are countries that have to think very carefully about their futures. Um, and I'm thinking particularly the dependence upon oil and gas. You know, COP26 is taking place right now in Britain. We know there's a kickback against carbon fuels. Uh, there, there needs to be very serious consideration about economic diversification, uh, the long-term future of these countries. Also, obviously, utilizing the existing wealth and in, investing it in, in appropriate ways to, to sustain these countries throughout the 21st century. And as a result of that, clearly there are some very, very bright um, individuals from Saudi Arabia, from Qatar, from Abu Dhabi. But I think what's interesting too is they're also hiring in some very smart advisors from places like McKinsey and from Bain and, and, and others who are advising them upon not just the strategic development of their countries generally, but I think how they can utilize sport. And so what you have is, is, is a much more serious and strategic engagement with sport. And so if you look at, for instance, if you look at City Football Group and, and the way in which City Football Group has enabled relationships to be built with, for example, private equity investment in the United States, but also the, the government in China. If you look at the way that City Football Group has been used as a means through which to establish a very firm presence in the Indian tech sector, but also the entertainment sector in, in India, particularly linked to, to, to Bollywood, for example. You know, this is very different to Gaddafi's um, uh, investment in, 
in football and 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 the the investment of other not just sovereign wealth funds but i think other investors from the middle east over the last 20 25 years um what i find very interesting is 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 that we currently hear stories about newcastle united struggling to uh uh appoint a manager um whether or not they get a, a high quality manager remains to be seen the inconvenient truth for, for for piff is that newcastle united may well get relegated and and so then it really does become is is this a vanity project is it a play thing or is is there a is there a strategy underpinning the acquisition i do think there is a strategy underpinning the acquisition we will see investment in the club from piff but i reiterate again that this is a means to an end, not an end in itself. And that, again, distinguishes this from, from previous investments that we've seen. Thanks again, Simon. We've got a related question from uh, Herman Yo, but this is about Qatar. And for those of you who do not know, uh, Simon is, was also the director of research for the Qatar World Cup. So the question is, for Qatar, sport tourism is part of its soft power strategy that includes art, education, and the media. The World Cup as a sporting mega event is something else, especially after the Emirates had been awarded the World Cup in December 2010. And the inter international sporting press sneered at the country's pretension to football status. So who's sneering now? And more importantly, how do you assess the degree of soft disempowerment, a term used to describe that the host loses more than they can gain in terms of its nation branding image? Sorry, Clemens, that was a two-part question. Can you tell me what the uh, what the first part was uh, was again? So the first part was about uh, the press, the international sporting press, sneering at Qatar's pretension to football status when it was first awarded uh, the World Cup to host the World Cup. So, so where where is the Emirate now in terms of you know uh, public in the public eye, especially and, and and the press's eye, and whether you know it has. Whether, how do you examine the degree of soft disempowerment in terms of its nation branding image? Have they lost more than they gain or gain more than they lost over the years? That's, that's, that's like about 8 million questions. That's not two questions. That's 8 million questions. Okay, so what, we, what I'm going to do is I'm going to develop a module on that question alone. And I'm going to teach this module for two hours a week for 25 weeks. So if you'd all like to come back in about six months and I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question through a module. That's, that's an incredible question. Uh, thank you for it. Obviously, we're, we're, I'm, I'm here today talking the day after uh, Platini and Blatter have been charged with corruption in Switzerland. And, and you know, this all traces back to uh, the 2010 announcement um, about World Cup hosting rights for 2018 and 2022. There's a whole, whole series of issues uh, about um, you know, bribery and corruption and bidding process and FIFA governance. I think it's fair to say that at, at that time, there was a way of bidding for World Cup tournaments. And we even know that, that Germany, 2006, France, 98, have become embroiled in this, this investigation. And, and, and I think it's somewhat disingenuous and somewhat unfair to, to single out Qatar as being the sole perpetrator of how can I put this without um, getting sued of, of playing a bidding game that didn't uphold good standards of governance, good, good governance principles. You know, Russia did it. You know, it looks like Germany may well have done it. You know, probably South Africa was involved too. France was involved and so on and so forth. So that's the first thing that I would say. And I think Qatar has been singled out in a way that serves a Western agenda when in reality, Western nations have also been complicit in enabling that to happen. My, my, can I just say at this point, just as a quick aside, I'm, I'm not absolving Qatar of any blame. Now, if Qatar has been engaged in wrongdoing, then that should be highlighted. 
and uh, and and if sanctions need to be taken in some form, then that should apply for Qatar for everybody else who is is guilty of of wrongdoing. Um, if we then look at you know, what if if we believe that sport is a is a force for good and many people across the world will talk about sport as a force for good you know it can address societal issues it can address cultural issues it can address political problems then we we have to understand and accept what not just what Qatar has done, but also what Saudi Arabia is now trying to do. And, and Saudi Arabia very often makes bold claims about effecting social change through sport. And that is something that everybody around the world says sport can be a force for good. But I think what that then does is it raises a whole series of issues. What changes is sport going to bring about? Um, how do we know those changes have taken place? You know, have you actually made good on the promises that, that 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 you initially asserted? And so that then does then begin to get into you know how how sport is governed and transparency and openness and reporting. And this notion of reporting, I think, is a really, really interesting one because we have no common global standard for reporting the impacts of sport. Um, and and so for countries that are claiming that you know, there, there is a soft power effect linked to sport. Um, where can we see this? How do we measure it? And, and, and you're then into well, if there is a soft power effect or there's a soft disempowerment effect, you know, how do we measure that? How do we prove it? You know, what tools are we going to use? Because I'm not exactly clear on how we do that. Are people, are people thinking more negatively now about Qatar? than they used to well i would go say go back to november 2010 be, you know, a month before the world cup bid announcement was made most people never heard of qatar most people didn't know anything about qatar most people could not attribute any any values or any qualities or or a particular reputation to qatar and so you know, i think qatar now and and if you look at you know it, it always amazes me when i walk around in British cities, how many people are wearing Paris Saint-Germain tops and how many people know that Paris Saint-Germain is owned by Qatar? And they're not talking about you know, soft disempowerment. They're not talking about sport washing. They're talking about Net Messi. They're talking about Neymar. They're talking about the, the, the Parc des Princes. They're talking about the Champions League. And, and so whilst I acknowledge that there has been some soft disempowerment, there has also been a soft power effect too. One thing that I would say from my time working in Qatar is, is has, uh, has sport effective, effected this positive change um, that, that many people talk about? I would say, yes, it has. Has it, been, has it gone far enough? No, it hasn't. Has it gone fast enough? No, it hasn't. Are there still issues? Yes, there are. Are some of these issues serious? Yes, I think they are. But you know, you could look at any country. You could look at Saudi Arabia and say the same thing. You could look at Singapore and say the same thing. You could look at Britain and say the same thing. Because one of the effects of the 2012 hosting of the Olympic Games in London was supposed to be suddenly Britain would become healthier and more active and play sport more regularly it's actually had the opposite effect. In Britain, participation in sport has fallen dramatically since 2012. You know, that's soft disempowerment. You know, there was supposed to be a soft power effect. There wasn't. There's been soft disempowerment. So I hope that one of the lessons or one of the conclusions you'll take about me today uh, from, from, from the webinar is... You know, this kind of labeling in terminology that we selectively apply to countries like Qatar or Saudi Arabia or Abu Dhabi, my view is that we also need to be careful in applying them to other countries as well. We, we need to apply them to other countries and we need to understand what's happening in the Gulf region within that context, but also within a wider context as well. Thanks, Simon. We've got another interesting question uh, by Tracy Lim uh, on you know, the, the relationship between health 
and sport. And, and here she says esports has become part of Saudi Arabia's branding and they've got two personalities winning eFootball tournaments recently. So, but the development of successful elite professional athletes is as much an indication of public health infrastructure, meaning how healthy society is, as much as it is about winning medals. In this regard, how is Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states doing in developing their own professional athletes? Again, that's a really, really great question. And again, it probably requires a much longer answer than, uh, than I can give right now. Um, I mean, I, I think the, Saudi Arabia needs to do more right now because what the world doesn't know is that the country actually has some fantastic esports players. So I think the world, the world female university esports champion is a Saudi Arabian woman. Um, and, and, and she's got a long track record of, of being the best esports player in the world. And, and yet the world doesn't know about this. And, and one of the things I mentioned in my slide, I talked about climate and, and how climate interacts with um, sport in, in, in the Gulf region. And you know, in very simplistic terms, for quite a long time each year, quite a long period each year, it's actually very hot to engage in physical activity outside. And so in, inevitably, esports becomes not just a popular pastime, but potentially becomes a, a source of international competitive advantage for a country like Saudi Arabia. You know, you play indoors in air-conditioned venues. You can develop expertise, develop competence in a way that perhaps you can't do with outdoor sports when the period during which you can play those sports is, is, is truncated. So that's one thing that I would say. I think more specifically to, 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 to what Tracy has said, there are some very interesting issues and, and, and I, I'm going to try and be short and sharp. I find it difficult to answer in a really kind of succinct way. Um, if we take Qatar as an example, Qatar has done, seems to be developing well on in to, uh, really on the basis of two two approaches so the first one and and, and this is has been contentious is, is player harvesting athlete harvesting so um some of you may be familiar with uh, uh um qatar's leading center forward the qatar national team's leading center forward ali al mois uh who is who was Born, born and brought up initially in, in Sudan, but he's now a naturalized Qatari citizen. Um, and so Qatar, to a certain extent, in, I think in the early years, going back to the 2000s, was initially depending upon player harvesting from or athlete harvesting from Africa. Uh, this kind of naturalization, again, I mean, this is not a criticism of Qatar, because if you look at what China is doing with its national team right now, it's naturalizing um, um, football players. If you look at British, French, Spanish, Portuguese colonial history and what that has meant in terms of their athlete development and their athlete harvesting, the same thing is happening there. So I think certainly in Qatar, we've seen harvesting, but more recently in, in Qatar, what we've seen is the creation through the, the, um, uh, through the Aspire Academy is the targeting of talented young individuals who then are trained developed to become elite professional athletes and we look at the Qatar national football team which now is performing very very well uh there's the Qatari high jumper who uh won the gold medal in in Tokyo um this summer um you know he too is a, a is a is a, a born and brought up in Qatar he is Qatari and so there is something about the system in place Certainly in Qatar, but I think increasingly we're going to see this in, in some of the other Gulf nations as well, whereby you can effectively hot house talent and that talent, some of that talent will be domestic. Um, some of that talent will, will, will be will be from elsewhere uh, in the world. I think the difference obviously between Dubai, uh, Abu Dhabi, Qatar, Bahrain and Saudi Arabia is the size of the population. You know, clearly, Saudi Arabia is a much bigger country. You know, we're talking about 34, 35 million people. The level of domestic talent will be larger. Um, the opportunities to hothouse and develop that domestic talent through, a, through a, a domestic system will be greater. And I think crucially as well, just to, to, to kind of emphasize about Saudi Arabia, there's historically much stronger engagement with sport, I think, than, than, um, 
than there has been in other Gulf states. <clears throat> I'm thinking about football, for example. Some of you will know those top Saudi Arabian football clubs, they're, they're drawing average attendances each weekend of 40,000, 50,000 people. So I think there is a sport culture in Saudi Arabia, a stronger sport culture in Saudi Arabia, uh, that will enable opportunities in a way that you know, perhaps has taken longer in, in, in nations like Qatar and Abu Dhabi. Thanks, Simon. And I know you, you've you been writing a lot about fan engagement in the GCC as well. So hopefully uh, we'll get to read that once it's officially out. Um, let's use the remaining five minutes to, to get through uh, two more questions. One, I'm I'll, try, to, I'll to... try to answer them quite quickly yeah. if I can. <laughs> yes. So, so the first one being uh, Liverpool FC manager Jurgen Klopp recently said three teams are owned by countries. While he did say that it doesn't mean they will be instant winners. You know, what does it mean for the competitive landscape of football? And is football a market where the priority has been fixing financial problems instead of sporting criteria? My, in some ways, I prefer not to think in terms. So I, a lot of what I've talked about this morning has involved me talking about countries. But it is almost as I, I prefer not to talk about countries and instead prefer to talk about ideologies because if we take Liverpool as an example Liverpool is owned by uh, a US um, sports entrepreneur and that US, that, that, that US sports entrepreneur he, he, he and his family are a product of a liberal um, commercially oriented capitalist system and you know if you take the debate back to the 19th century football clubs weren't owned by capitalists football clubs were owned by you know local people they were they were very often owned by you know sometimes by workers sometimes by local business owners they weren't owned by north american capitalists so i i think for klopp to say that is is somewhat misleading and disingenuous because late late 20th century and early 21st century european football was increasingly dominated by an idea by a western ideology that emphasized free enterprise profit commercial return we're now living in a in, in a period where that liberal ideology is is being threatened it's it's being threatened by an idea, a rival ideology in which state intervention, government policy, and, and, and different kind of sociocultural norms and behaviors characterize investments. And, and that doesn't mean that it's any better than or any worse than what has gone before. But, but I think you know, what Klopp seems to be confusing is, is that somehow you know, kind of capitalist football is somehow better than than you know, a more kind of interventionist type football. You know, I don't think we can necessarily say that. If you go, I, I've been doing this for a long time. If you go back to the 1990s, early 2000s, certainly when the Glazers took over Manchester United, there was people were horrified. Fans were horrified that investors could possibly run a football club for profit. And yet now here we are and, and people just accept, you know, football clubs are profitable. The Henry family owns Liverpool. Um, the Glazer family owns Manchester United. They're going to focus on revenue generation. They're going to look at controlling their costs. You know, that's, that's acceptable. That's perfectly normal. But then when Saudi Arabia comes along or when Qatar comes along or where Abu Dhabi comes along and says, well, actually, we're going to run, run a club in a different way. Suddenly that's a terrible, terrible thing. I think... You know, that in 10 years time or maybe in 20 years time, we'll look back and, and many people will, will better understand what has happened over the last 50 years of football. And that is that we've, we've just had different ideologies, not different countries, but different ideologies exerting an influence on European football. As regards performance, um, that's a big one. Uh, I think from a fan perspective, fans only care about their teams winning. Uh, when teams win, fans stop asking questions, whether it's about profit or sport washing, you know, fans stop asking questions when teams win. Uh, I think 
I'll try to I'll try to shut up in a second. The one thing that I would say is that the essence of sport, and for those sports economists in the room, um, there is this notion of uncertainty of outcome. So football is about uncertainty of outcome. That's the core principle. In other words, you don't know who's going to win. And that's why many of us engage with football in the first place, because of uncertainty of outcome. You get uncertainty of outcome through competitive, uh, competitive balance. And competitive balance is essentially all the teams are kind of roughly equal. And if you go back to you know, the 1970s, 1980s, very often that's what you would get in European football. You'd get uncertainty of outcome, competitive balance. But I think through the investment of, you know, as we've seen, Abu Dhabi at Manchester City, uh, Qatar Sports Investments at, at the Paris Saint-Germain, that competitive balance is being eroded and the, the, the uncertainty of outcome is being eroded. So I'm not going to get into the whole debate about this now, but I'll leave this just to hang there. You know, the fundamental, the core component, the core of the sport product, the core product of football, this uncertainty of outcome, the competitive balance is being challenged by the investment of Qatar Sports Investments, Saudi Arabia's public investment fund, uh, the people who are invested at uh, Manchester City and City Football Group. Thanks, Simon. So to round off our discussion for today, and we've got, we've missed on a, a few questions, but our final question today is, is about, you know, inspiration and motivation in, in football. And we've, we've, so far, we've, we've talked a bit about the relationship with the golf, football, uh, other sports. And now we want to talk about Mohamed Salah, you know, Arab Muslim as a player who is now being discussed as the best in the world, arguably. His impact is generally greater than, the, than PSG and, and Newcastle United. It's the first time a player from the region and the Muslim is mentioned in such lofty terms. So what is his impact on the region, not just in sport, but as a role model who comes without the baggage that the Gulf states have? That is, uh, that again is a great question. Um, I was I was interviewed by the, the Sunday Times uh, three weeks ago or maybe four weeks ago about Mohamed Salah. Um, because I you know, clearly he, he's a great, great player, you know, incredible player. And he seems, I don't know who, I don't know him, but he seems like a very, very nice guy, very, very humble, very family oriented. Um, but the Sunday Times interviewer wanted to, wanted to know why I, well, his first question was, what role do you think he has played? Um, and why, why did I think that he hasn't become a, a much more potent commercial force? I think certainly speaking from a, a British perspective, Salah had a very interesting effect because he he arrived back in the country by signing for Liverpool. Obviously, he played for Chelsea before, but he arrived back at Liverpool at a, at a time when there was, a I think, the, the, the debate about um, Islam and Islamophobia was, was really still quite intense. Um, and, and obviously that was set in the, the context of a very turbulent period in recent British history, which obviously involved a number of terrorist incidents um, and, and, and a number of, of hate crimes being perpetrated against um, Muslims in Britain. And Salah, therefore, served, I, I think, a, a purpose in terms of social cohesion and and. Some of some of your your, your listeners are, will will know. Some of the people who are here today will know that you know, Liverpool fans were, were even singing about going to the mosque as a, as a result of, of of Salah scoring goals. And and so I think there was this period, you know, kind of 2017 2018, where Salah appeared to be serving a a, a very important socio cultural purpose, certainly in Britain. But it was it was then almost as though he was seduced. Salah was seduced by uh, the commercial returns potentially that 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 could deliver to him. So I know, for example, that he signed a deal with with DHL, and and having signed those deals, um, there was a little bit of a kickback against him. Certainly in 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 certainly from within Muslim communities that that you know he was 
commercially taking advantage of his his fandom and and you know that he shouldn't necessarily do this and and it is almost as I I sensed and this is what I said to to the Sunday Times journalist that that Salah took a step back from that and and that he has really stepped back from the limelight off the field and and has stepped back from those commercial deals. And I think a crucial a crucial detail in all of this is is that Salah's agent and commercial advisor is his brother. If Salah had signed for, for example, Rock Nation, you know, which which is Jay Z's sports agency, and and Lewis Hamilton, for example, is a is a client of Rock Nation. And if we look at Lewis Hamilton, you know, Lewis Hamilton has now got an opinion about everything. And is is you know is involved in all manner of campaigns and commercial deals, and and that is very much a reflection of of his relationship with Rock Nation. So Rock Nation will be strategically advising Hamilton about the things he should and shouldn't be doing. You know, Salah didn't sign for Rock Nation; he stayed with his brother advising him. And and so what we have is somebody who is very modest, very humble, uh, somebody who I think is still talismanic. But certainly commercially, but I think also socioculturally too, in terms of the role that he could potentially play in, in, in countries like Britain, you know, Salah hasn't become what potentially we thought he might become when 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 he was back here in, in kind of 2017, 2018. Thanks, Simon. So we've run out of time. In fact, we've overrun and we're quite ambitious to have it. Uh, to an hour and, and I think the number of questions that we received probably says that it should have been an hour and a half but if you'd like to put forward your questions still please email or, or contact Professor Simon Chadwick on, on Twitter or by email and I'd like to thank Simon once again for addressing Can, can, can I just say Can I just say Clement Can yes, I just please, say Simon, uh, go ahead. The point that, As I said the point of my presentation is football enables things and, and the, the, the webinar is a prime example of it, because as soon as you start to talk about football, you're talking about Mo Saleh, you're talking about oil and gas, you're talking about um, you know, health and active lifestyles, you're talking about success. and fit. So you know, that, that, in essence, the reason that we've gone on for so long validates the core premise of the, the webinar in the first place, is which, which is that football enables things to happen. Thank you, Simon, once again. So once again, thank you to MEI Events for making this operational and to our audience, thank you for making this lively because we've got really, really, really great questions coming in and tough ones as well. And, and I think Simon, you've, you've managed to address them as succinctly as possible. And if you've got any further burning questions, please contact uh, Simon directly by email or on Twitter. So thank you once again. Uh, if you're joining us in Singapore, then have a good public holiday tomorrow. Uh, oh, sorry, Clement, it's public it. holiday tomorrow. Does this mean I could take a, day, take a day off work tomorrow? Well, I don't think it is in the in the UK, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, neither in France nor the UK. I, there's no public holiday, so never mind. All right. Thanks again. We'll, Thank we'll speak you. Soon, Simon. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Bye.